morning, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of the Huntsman Cancer Institute Melanoma Center and my co-leader, Doug Grossman, I would like to welcome you to our patient symposium focused on melanoma. This event was made possible by the Melanoma Research Foundation, the University of Utah, the Huntsman Cancer Foundation, and the Huntsman Cancer Institute. I would like to extend a special thank you to Andrew Grandemange, who is our HCI Melanoma Center Program Manager, as well as Amy Marbaugh, who is the MRF Education Officer, for all of their work putting this symposium together. I would also like to thank Andy Dow, who is our HCI Computer Technician, who is helping us today for this hybrid event, which is both virtual and in-person. The HCI Melanoma Center is co-led by myself and Dr. Doug Grossman. We are assisted by John Hinkstrom, who coordinates our clinical trials and our patient treatment conference, as well as Robert Judson Torres, who coordinates our melanoma supergroup research in progress meetings. Again, as mentioned earlier, we are assisted by our program manager, Andrew Grandemage. Our membership includes about 47 members consisting of uh, physicians, uh, basic scientists, physician scientists, as well as genetic counselors, um, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, research data assistants and coordinators, as well as administrative assistants. We have broad representation in six different departments consisting of dermatology, medicine, oncological sciences, pathology, radiation oncology, and surgery. We also represent all four cancer center programs, cell response and regulation, experimental therapeutics, nuclear control, and cancer control and population sciences. Research within the melanoma center spans the spectrum of the disease, beginning with inherited genetic alterations, as well as environmental risk factors, investigators that focus on melanoma prevention, as well as early initiation, those that focus on um, disease progression, as well as metastatic spread to distant sites, uh, immunotherapy or immunology of melanoma, as well as a number of different investigators that work um, focused on the treatment of the disease. So we have a, an excellent lineup for you today, um, consisting of everything from prevention to treatment, starting off with Robert Judson Torres, the best offense is a good defense. And Dr. Grossman will talk about different sunscreens and Dr. Florell will mention um, how to understand a pathology report. We'll then have a panel discussion where you can ask questions and um, further get further information on all the topics that have been discussed in this first session. We'll then have a short break followed by discussion of different surgical management strategies, um, blood tests that can, protect, can potentially detect melanoma recurrence, uh, melanoma treatment, as well as HCI wellness um, and the wellness and integrative health um, for patients living with melanoma. We will then have another panel discussion on those topics um, and some closing remarks. So again, welcome and I hope you enjoyed the program. Hello, and welcome to the Melanoma Research Foundation's 14th Annual Patient and Caregiver Symposia Series. My name is Kylie LaPera, CEO of the MRF. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this event empowers you and provides you with the tools and information you need as a patient or caregiver to navigate your journey. I wanna start off by thanking our generous sponsors of our National Symposia Series, Alchemies, Genentech, Bristol Myers Squibb, Iovance, and Merck. And I want to also start off with just giving you a little bit of history and overview of how the MRF started and a little bit more about our mission. So the MRF was founded 26 years ago by a patient by the name of Diana Ashby, who was suffering her third recurrence with melanoma. At that time, there were very limited treatment options. And out of her frustration, came the idea of bringing family and friends together to fundraise for melanoma research. Over the years, our mission has expanded as we not only fund research, but we also educate the patients, their caregivers, as well as the general community about melanoma, as well as advocating for their needs. Our footprint is a national one. While we are based in Washington, DC, we have events all over the country. And you can get involved too, whether that be a Miles for Melanoma 
5K run walk, attending one of our galas, advocating on Capitol Hill during our annual advocacy days, or attending events like today. In terms of the research arm of our mission, we are very excited to share that we have funded over $21.2 million in research grants to date. These grants are awarded through our peer-reviewed research grant program. But you can also be a part of that as well. Each year we call on patients and their loved ones to serve as advocate reviewers. And if that is something that interests you, please visit our website at melanoma.org. We also host scientific initiatives, as well as workshops in specific topics like brain metastases, ocular melanoma, or mucosal melanoma, as well as hosting our Breakthrough Consortium, which brings sites from all over the country together to work on research initiatives. In terms of our education, like today, which is a big part of our education program, we offer educational materials at no cost to the community. You can visit our website and either download the materials or we can ship them directly to you. We also host webinars and our animated melanoma patient videos, which are two to three minutes of animation that take very large complex topics and distill them down to a lay audience. We also have a large focus on the rare subtypes, which include ocular, mucosal, and pediatric. One of our webinar series is called Ask the Expert. And we're really excited to share this with you all today and hope that you can register and view one of these during the course of the year. They will be a registration platform, but then we will also stream, stream to our social media channels as well. They will be offered twice per month and the topics will range from diagnosis to treatment, prevention, management of side effects, psychological needs, and more. In terms of our national advocacy program, as I mentioned, we are both on the federal and state level. We focus in a few core areas, such as research funding through the NCI, NIH, and DOD, prevention and awareness, access, and education. And lastly, we encourage you all to stay involved. You see our social media tags on the left-hand side. We encourage you to use those today as you listen to the symposium and ask questions, and also to find out more information, please visit us at melanoma.org. Thank you and enjoy today's program. Hi, my name is Rob Judson Torres. I'm an assistant professor in dermatology at the University of Utah, an investigator at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, and a Five for the Fight and Harry J. Lloyd Research Fellow. I direct a research laboratory seeking to better understand melanoma the deadliest common skin cancer. Specifically, we specialize in characterizing the origins of the disease to ask the questions, where does melanoma come from? What determines who gets melanoma and why are some melanomas worse than others? We practice bedside to bench to bedside science, whereby we work closely with our teams of clinicians to ensure our experiments address current needs in the workflow of patient care. Every experiment we conduct, we can only do so through the generosity of our patients donating tissue for research and the collaborative spirit of our clinicians seeking to continuously improve their options for care. My goals today are both to tell you about some of our recent discoveries and to help you to understand how research is conducted. To achieve these goals, I will first tell you about the theory behind our research, the 10,000 foot view specifically discussing why we believe that the key to defeating melanoma is through an approach called cancer interception. After that, I will discuss the scientific process, how and why we ask the questions we do. Finally, we will roll up our sleeves and get into some of the details of our recent discoveries, distilled to be approachable, but with enough detail to give you an idea of both the tangible challenges and the tangible excitement of being in the laboratory. So first, let me discuss the theory of cancer interception. Many of you likely recognize this quote, best defense is a good offense quoted to Jack Dempsey. This adage is also known as the strategic offensive principle of war. The imagery of war is frequently adopted to describe a patient's struggle with melanoma and with other cancers. This imagery and verbiage is everywhere. The idea of a battle, the concept of magic bullets. In 1971, President Nixon even declared an official war on cancer. 
And in some ways, this invocation is very understandable. What starts as a single small tumor can grow and spread and grow and spread. The term invasion is literal here. These tumors invade the body and they kill. And so the concept of fighting back, it is visceral, it is real, and it is critically important that every patient does so with the support of their loved ones, their clinical caretakers, and whatever present or future tools and therapies we can develop to help them win this battle. However, here's another famous quote regarding war, and there are many more like it expressing similar sentiments. No one wins a war. That a war starts at all, ever, is a profound loss. Does the common metaphor describing a patient's experience with cancer as war extend so far as to also include the sentiment? I believe it does, very much so. For even in the best circumstances where a patient is completely cured, the cost, the emotional toll on the patient, on their loved ones, the fear, the anxiety, the effect on their bodies, the financial burden, the time, all lost never to be regained. These are real costs, real hardships, shouldered by the participants in these battles, even by the winners. And so much of cancer research is devoted to developing strategies in the arsenal for winning the war once it has started. And it is impossible to overstate the importance of this research or the number of patients still alive today because of it. However, in addition to these tools, I argue that it is also desirable to quote unquote, win these wars by not allowing them to start in the first place. This idea flips the, the strategic offensive principle of war to a defensive principle. In cancer research, there are strategies to do exactly this. One you are already familiar with is called prevention. Another you may not have heard before is called interception. Now hearing that word, you might think of American football and you would be absolutely correct in thinking of an appropriate analogy. Let's say we wanted to win a football game with defensive tactics, how would we do that? One option would be to sack the opposing team's quarterback every single time he or she gets the ball, literally never gets a pass off, no runs, no kicks, no handoffs, not once the entire game. I would argue this is an exceptionally good strategy and every team should do it if they can. But in actuality, it's pretty hard to execute fully. In cancer, we would consider this prevention. In melanoma, that means reducing exposure to UV radiation. So no sunlight, no tanning beds. UV exposure substantially increases the risk of melanoma. It's that simple. So prevention means wear long sleeves, wear hats, also wear sunscreen. Don't sunbathe, don't go out in the heat of the day, stay in the shade and do not in any circumstance use a tanning bed. Also make sure you adhere to these rules every day from childhood through adulthood. What happens when the opportunity for prevention is missed or these recommendations are not strictly adhered to? UV increases the risk of melanoma, true, but not all melanomas are due to UV exposure. So also, what do we do in those cases where we do not have a preventative strategy? Well, if the ball is successfully passed, another option is to immediately tackle the receiver. We would call this early detection. The cancer started, but we got it early. For early detection, see your dermatologist regularly. Know the signs of an early melanoma and make sure to routinely use both your eyes and your loved one's eyes to look over your own body. If melanomas are caught at this early stage, they can almost always be cured with a simple skin surgery. Now, what if this opportunity is missed? Well, on the football field, now we're faced with the scramble to chase down the other team. What if they score? Well, now we need to score, and we need to score more than them. What if they keep scoring? All too often, it is on this side of the spectrum that our clinicians and patients are faced with an uphill battle with an aggressive and rapidly changing opponent. This is intervention, it includes surgical interventions, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy. This is where that toll of war begins to kick in, regardless of eventual win or loss. Now there is another potential strategy. And to see this strategy, we need to recognize that even if we fail to sack the quarterback, and even if that QB manages to pitch a perfect pass toward a receiver, that the pass itself is a process. And like any process, if we understand it well enough, if we can anticipate it, we could not only stop it from happening, but we could also turn it to our advantage. In football and in cancer care, this is called interception. Now, how does this metaphor of interception come into play with skin cancer? What is the process that we can disrupt? To explain this to you, I'm going to need to pause on the metaphors for a while and start to tell you about what we actually do in the laboratory. 
Nearly every experiment we run in our lab starts with a small piece of human skin, usually about a square centimeter. That is about the size of this little white square shown here on this palm. We dissect human skin on a cellular and molecular level, and I'd like to show you what that means. In this amazing video, you'll first see us zoom into this centimeter by centimeter square. You'll recognize skin texture that you might know, dare I say it, like the back of your own hand. 10 times smaller and a single bit of texture takes up the whole view, but we are not yet looking at cells. Tenfold more magnified and we can see the structure of the tissue. It's only a tenfold more magnification, so now a thousand times smaller than that initial box I showed you that we can see a cell. And within this cell, you can see other structures, organelles made up of macromolecules. The origins of melanoma of any cancer are the result of changes in these molecules, which result in a single cell, like this one, beginning to behave badly, to begin making many copies of itself and propagating and growing. By the time we often see a tumor, it is many times the size of this centimeter by centimeter box, but is already made up of thousands of cells, each holding within it that initial molecular change. Thus, for as alarming as a skin tumor is, even at an early stage when it is very first spotted, that tumor already has a long history and the humble origins of a single molecular change within a single cell, a thousand times smaller than what you can see here. Let's see if we can understand these origins a little bit better. You're probably familiar with this concept that mutations in the DNA of our cells are the cause of cancer. However, that mutation is only the first of a long series of complex molecular and cellular events that ends with the tumor cell. This is called transformation, and it is a process. And just like that perfect pass by our quarterback in the earlier slide, just because that process starts doesn't mean it has to land. We theoretically should have the opportunity of stopping a healthy cell from ever transforming into a cancer cell, even when it gets a mutation. To explain this, I'd like to invoke yet another metaphor that I suspect everyone can relate to. It is, a, it is a metaphor that transcends all living generations and the spectrum of culture from the very popular to the very nerdy. And that is the transformation of the fictional Dr. Bruce Banner, most recently played by actor Mark Ruffalo, to the CGI monstrosity known as the Incredible Hulk. What causes Mark's transformation? If you know anything about Hulk mythology, the one thing you probably know is that you do not want to make Mark angry. Anger causes the Hulk. That's absolutely true. It is also not entirely true. Why? Many of us get angry, some of us quite often, but it is rare, if ever, that we actually turn into Hulks. So it can't just be the anger. What else? Well, we know that Mark was exposed to high doses of gamma irradiation, permanently changing his DNA, just like the sunlight does to our skin cells. So that must be it. And it is, but it's also not. Right? First, most of the time, Mark is just Mark. He's not a Hulk. Second, we know a lot about the side effects of irradiation exposure. They are myriad, they are bad, but turning into a Hulk is very rarely, if ever, one of them. That means there is also something just different, special about Mark. No one of these things, the anger, mutation, the state of being Mark, is the cause of the Hulk, is the cause of the Hulk, but together they all are. And so this transformation of Mark is a spot-on metaphor for what we believe are the causes of melanoma. Yes, the mutation is part of it, but so is the state of the cell that receives that mutation, and so is what we would call an environmental trigger, like Mark stubbing his toe and getting angry. What is exciting about this framework is that whereas the mutation, we can only try to block through prevention, such as wearing sunscreen, these triggers are reversible. The Hulk can be dealt with by simply making him calm. And then we have charming Mark again, complete with these mutations, but not the Hulk. The concept of cancer interception works by the same principle, avoid dealing with the cancer by either preventing the process of transformation or reverse it using environmental factors. So that is the theory. But before I start talking about our data, I want to talk about the process of science. Science is a capitalized noun is misleading. It is not absolute, but a method by which we generate hypotheses, basically semi-educated guesses about what might be true in nature and biology. Then we run experiments carefully designed to test the truth of that guess. Now, if we've experienced one recurring lesson in the history of the scientific method is that nature has its own bizarre, beautiful, and mysterious logic. And it is exceedingly rare events that a human brain using human logic 
can correctly guess the mechanisms of nature on its first try. Einstein was attributed to saying, if we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? I completely agree. Research by definition is seeking to understand something we do not yet understand. Science is the process, therefore, spiraling toward the truth, always circling, often swinging too far in one direction or the other, or per perpetually getting closer. So our goal as cancer biologists is to get close enough to the truth to make a meaningful difference in our patients' lives. So the way we make sense of these complex and often, which can be misleading data, are to use statistics. Here's the first scientific data slide of this talk. These data summarize a large number of studies spanning decades. The summary graph is called a survival curve. Each colored line represents a group of melanoma patients who received a certain kind of therapy. Now I've included the legend that identifies each therapy in case anyone here is interested, but for the purposes of this example, the exact nature of each line doesn't matter. The vertical accent axis represents the percent of each group of patients that are alive, and the x-axis or the horizontal axis represents years after the initiation of the therapy. So at the start of each study, 100% of patients were alive in each group, and as time goes on, that number drops. If we compare the black line, an older therapy, to the dark green line, a new generation of combination immunotherapy, we can immediately see the extraordinarily extraordinary effect of this discovery on patients. With the old therapy, over 80% of patients passed within six years. With a new approach, this number dropped to less than 50%. That difference, labeled here as B, of about 30 to 40%, represents the number of patients still alive at year six who theoretically would not have been in the absence of the scientific discovery. This is what we would call a statistically meaningful result. The differences between these percentages cannot be explained by random chance or by any other variable other than the therapy. Therefore, the therapy caused this difference in survival. And the hundreds of scientists and cl uh, clinicians who contributed to the discovery and validation and distribution and use of this therapy have made an extraordinarily extraordinary contribution to knowledge. These types of data are absolutely critical for a clinician to advise a patient on the course of action that will most likely result in successful treatment. However, these are the statistics, but from the perspective of an individual, what does most likely mean? Is most likely meaningful to them? For the 30 to 40% of patients represented by bracket B, absolutely. These people are alive today because of those scientists' efforts. Each percentage point within this B bracket is a person still living, loving, contributing to the world due to this therapy. But here's the rub. For many of them, the answer is no. The therapy, inclusive of all of that effort, all that knowledge, all that research, had no meaningful contribution to their personal experience. These percentage points in bracket C, also about 40%, are also people who are remembered and loved but no longer with us. And so before I told you that science is the process of getting closer to the truth and that our goal as cancer biologists is to get close enough to the truth to make a meaningful difference in patients' lives. What this graph shows you is that for us, with our goals, each patient is their own truth. For some, we have accumulated enough knowledge that we have spiraled close enough to the truth to make a meaningful difference, even if we don't understand everything. For others, we are still so far in the dark that we weren't able to help. So how do we proceed? We take the groups we do not yet understand well enough to help, and we start again. Again, with the scientific method, we divide, we subdivide, we divide again. We keep dividing until we have the resolution to circle close enough to the truth for each of these patients to make a difference in their lives. This is personalized medicine. This is where we want to be. We are not there yet. How do we get there? My team has started with the hypothesis that there's something different about the origins of the melanomas that do not respond to therapies. Melanomas by definition arise from a type of cell in our skin called melanocytes, epidermal melanocytes that are fully responsible for giving us our different skin tones or colors, our tanning response and protection against the sun. Up until recently, it was thought that epidermal melanocytes were all about the same. A scientist on my team, Dr. Rachel Balut, we refer to her as the melanocyte whisperer. She has spent years looking through a microscope at melanocytes from human skin, and they look like this. And Rachel began to feel that she could tell them apart, that they were individuals. 
To be clear, every unit of life is unique, but to a casual observer, these differences are frequently lost. I, for example, I grew up on a sheep farm, and I had the ability to distinguish on site Molly from Dolly from Polly. But for those of you who may not be as familiar with the herd, I'd forgive you for thinking that all these sheep looked exactly the same. So now imagine the familiar, familiarity Rachel had with this one cell type in human skin, these melanocytes, to begin to appreciate each of them as different cells. At least that was her hypothesis. To test it, we collected 37 samples of fresh and healthy human skin from very generous donors. This was across different anatomic locations from the same individuals, individuals representing all ages, both sexes, and a diversity of ethnicities and skin tones. This is a cartoon cross section of our skin where the melanocytes are in purple. Rachel figured out how to rapidly isolate just those melanocytes from all the other bits of skin and how to look at the genetic expression of each individual cell, over 10,000 total. The result are data on every gene in each of those cells, over 200 million bits of data. The result is best summarized like this. Now, what is this? What you're looking at is a visual method of taking high dimensional data and plotting it so that our simple human brains can make sense of it. Each dot represents one cell. The closer the dots are, the more similar the molecules of those cells. The further apart, the more different. You can see they form clusters, groups of similar cells and groups of different cells. So I will tell you about three observations made from this graph that fundamentally altered our understanding of human melanocytes and the origins of melanoma. The first is perhaps the most special. It actually has nothing to do with them. Here I am showing you circled in red, just the adult epidermal melanocytes from the study. I'm now coloring them differently so that each color represents the person or the piece of skin that this melanocyte came from. So different colors equal cells from different people, same color equals cells from the same people. Now you might notice something really special. Again, each dot is colored by the person it came from and the distance apart represents how similar they are. When viewed in this manner, you can see one axis here in red, that represents the molecular differences in these cells across folks of different ages, sexes, ethnicities, and skin tones. And on this other axis in purple, the differences in these cells across the body of the same single individual. Which one is greater? It appears that on a molecular level, the cells that give us our skin tone are more different within the skin of a single individual than they are across different people. This is a really special observation. It is unexpected, it's also beautiful. When I first appreciated it, I just had to stop for a few minutes and reflect on a world that has put such emphasis on differences in skin color between people. And yet on the level of the molecular genetics, we actually see greater differences between the top and bottom of our own hands than we do across different people. It is in moments like these, these small windows into the meaning of our biology that I truly, truly appreciate my privilege of being a scientist. Now, what can we learn from these data regarding melanoma? Here I've colored these dots based upon the extremes of the spectrum. We wondered, what could these different types of melanocytes, could they cause different types of melanoma? Sure enough, we found that the cells represented by the red dots give rise to a type of melanoma that more frequently responds to modern therapies. The cells represented by the blue dots give rise to a type of melanoma that does not respond well to modern therapies. It means we discovered two different cells of origin for different groups of melanomas, suggesting that those tumors that do not respond well to therapies are just fundamentally different. These data are now allowing us to develop methods for predicting which patients will and will not respond to some of these therapies. And importantly, they allow us to begin testing novel therapeutics for the melanomas that do not respond. Finally, back to this concept of cancer interception. Can we use these data to identify candidate methods for preventing melanoma growth, even in mutated melanocytes? And the answers here so far look very exciting. We have found that melanocytes within a single piece of human skin exist in many different molecular states. Molecular states. To use the Hulk metaphor, we can call them an angry state and a calm state. When we experiment on these cells in the laboratory, we have found that melanoma, quote unquote, causing mutations, when introduced into angry cells, causes them to act like melanoma. However, the exact same mutation when introduced into calm cells causes them to act like moles. What's exciting is we have used this knowledge to develop small molecules, drugs, that make angry cells calm. And this works either before they transform, preventing the melanoma from ever occurring, but it also works after they transform, causing a melanoma to look more and act more like a mole.
That means these small molecules are now candidate therapeutics for both melanoma interception and melanoma intervention, which we're currently validating. So to wrap up, today I told you about the theory of cancer interception and why we believe it is both feasible and desirable to look a bit more closely at the origins of melanoma and to de determine if we can defeat it by stopping it from ever existing in the first place. I then offered you my perspective on the process of research and told you of three major, re three major recent discoveries from our team. Our characterization of the diversity of pigment producing cells within our skin, the identification of a distinct cell of origin for melanomas that respond poorly to therapies, and identification of small molecules that can force the cells of a melanoma to behave like the cells of a mole. In collaboration with our clinical teams, we are moving forward with each of these discoveries to see how patients at HCI and elsewhere might benefit from this new knowledge. I hope you enjoyed the lecture, that the insight was informative, and that the data were interesting. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Doug Grossman. I'm glad to uh, be with you this morning and um, talk about sunscreens. Do they work and are they safe? These are questions I often get from patients. My melanoma was on the bottom of my foot. So does wearing sunscreen really make a difference? Will using sunscreen make me vitamin D deficient? Does it matter which sunscreen I use? Why am I still getting tan? I'm using a sunscreen with an SPF of 100. Are sunscreen ingredients really safe? Why is the sunscreen you recommend not on Consumer Reports' list? So when we talk about sunscreen, uh, really what we're trying to do is minimize the harmful effects of ultraviolet or UV exposure. Um, we know that um, most melanomas occur in sun-exposed areas. And um, often melanomas do arise from moles or nevi. And we're particularly high risk in Utah because of our high altitude. Uh, the sun is stronger here. Uh, we have a fair skin population. People spend more time outside. And so all that increases risk. In addition, um, uh, many people have used tanning beds. Um, and even one or two exposures uh, we know can double your risk of melanoma. And so how does UV exposure promote melanoma? Um, there, uh, there's a broad spectrum of, of wavelengths that are, that are contained in normal sunlight, but um, the, the highest energy wavelengths that would be the most damaging are actually filtered out by the atmosphere um, uh, and the ozone layer. Um, and then the visible light spectrum uh, that we can see um, penetrates uh, just the very upper layers of the skin, but um, is not really associated with significant damage. Uh, however, um, this intermediate part of the spectrum, um, the UVA wavelengths penetrate very deep into the skin. Uh, and the UVB wavelengths uh, also penetrate um, into the skin. And so th these are what are primarily targeted by sunscreens. Um, UV radiation um, activates different uh, pathways uh, in the skin that can um, affect the blood vessels and cause the skin cells to die. Uh, and that's what is happening when you get a sunburn. Uh, in addition, um, uh, on a microscopic level, uh, UV exposure is inducing an inflammatory response. Um, UV light can directly damage uh, the DNA of cells and cause mutations um, and also suppress the immune system in the skin. And so all these factors can potentially promote development of skin tumors and their growth. So how do sunscreens work? As I said, that uh, the major uh, wavelengths that we're, we're trying to target are UVA and UVB. Uh, and without uh, sunscreen, these will penetrate uh, through the outer layer of skin, the epidermis, uh, and down into the dermis. Um, there are two different classes of sunscreens. The mineral-based sunscreens act by reflecting the UV rays. So um, these sit on the surface of the skin and both uh, UVA and UVB wavelengths 
uh, uh, upon interacting with them are reflected away. And so this prevents the, the UV from actually entering the deeper levels of the skin. Uh, by contrast, chemical-based sunscreens act by absorption. And so these compounds are applied to the skin, they're absorbed into the skin, uh, and they act by absorbing the uh, UV radiation once it enters the skin. So we know sunscreens are effective. Um, first of all, uh, in kids, uh, we have multiple studies. This was one that was conducted in Australia in which they took almost 700 um, school children and randomized them to um, applying sunscreen daily uh, or not over three consecutive summers. Uh, and there was a clear uh, difference in the sunscreen group uh, over several years ended up with fewer nevi. Um, this was recapitulated in a, a study in Colorado. And so I generally tell patients that if they can protect their kids from, from excessive sun exposure, they might be able to reduce the number of moles that they'll get eventually get by up to half. Sunscreens also reduce melanoma risk. Uh, this was a large study in Australia in which adults were randomized to daily or uh, discretionary sunscreen use over a five-year period uh, and then followed up um, for 10 years beyond that. And there were twice as many melanomas uh, were detected um, in the uh, uh, group that uh, shown in yellow there that didn't have the sunscreen intervention. And so um, in this study here, use of sunscreen was associated with a 50% um, risk uh, of melanoma development. So that's significant. So sunscreens work. Let's talk more in more detail about these two different classes of sunscreens. So the mineral-based sunscreens, uh, the most common minerals that are used are zinc, and titanium, and their compounds in the form of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Um, Blue Lizard is uh, my choice of sunscreen. Um, it has, um, as you see there, 10% zinc, 5% titanium dioxide. Uh, you can also buy sunscreens that uh, have just zinc or just titanium, um, and there are multiple products that, uh, that have these compounds. For chemical-based sunscreens, these are the most common uh, chemical-based uh, sunscreen ingredients. And these are in a variety of products. And usually most products will have multiple sunscreens, uh, chemical sunscreens. So what do you, should you be looking for in a sunscreen? Um, I think everyone has heard of SPF, which stands for sun protection factor. So what this means is if you're using this sunscreen, the sun protection factor tells you um, how many more times uh, uh, you could stay out in the sun uh, and get this, the same level of, of, uh, of uh, uh, a sunburn versus if you weren't using the product. So in other words, if, if a sun screen has a sun protector protection factor of two, that means that you can stay out in the sun twice as long uh, to get the same amount of, um, uh, of UV reaction or sunburn. So that would correlate to about 50% protection. So we all know SPF2 doesn't sound very high, uh, but you can see there, um, you rapidly get significant protection without too much uh, increase in the SPF. So by the time you're at, uh, over SPF8, you're already at 90% protection, 97% uh, protection with an SPF of 30. So you really don't achieve much more protection going higher than 30. Uh, and actually the new, the new guidelines from the, um, uh, for, for sunscreen uh, marketing are gonna uh, suggest that, that actually SPF factors greater than 30 not be used. So you'll, you'll see some sunscreens now that'll just say 30 plus, meaning that it's greater than 30. Um, you want something that's broad spectrum. And so what that means is it's gonna protect against both the UVA and the UVB wavelengths. Um, waterproof uh, is also desirable. Um, sunscreens are usually rated waterproof if um, uh, they can last for uh, between 40 and 80 minutes um, uh, while getting wet. Um, so obviously they have to be reapplied. Um, if if you're in the water. 
Um, ideally, sunscreen should not uh, cause uh, skin allergy um, or um, any other problems with the skin like acne. So what are the real differences? Um, mineral sunscreens uh, tend to be a little bit more expensive. Um, and often there is a, a whitish residue um, that it can be visible on the skin. Uh, a lot of people don't like them for that reason. Um, and uh, they tend to be a little bit greasier than chemical-based uh, sunscreens, but they're much more stable uh, because these are uh, inorganic uh, minerals that really don't break down. Whereas the chemical sunscreens, uh, those chemicals break down after a couple of hours. And that's why you have to keep reapplying them. Um, Chemical sunscreens, as I said, are absorbed while mineral sunscreens are not. Um, chemical sunscreens tend to be associated more with uh, allergy, allergic reactions than mineral-based. And the chemical sunscreens also, several are toxic to marine life. Um, and several of these starting last year uh, were banned in the state of Hawaii for that reason. What about vitamin D? So vitamin D is a critical uh, vitamin. Um, for your bones uh, uh, and other, other aspects of your health. Um, and we're not able to make vitamin D uh, uh, on our own. Uh, and so it actually is synthesized in the skin uh, and UV radiation is required for that. Um, uh, sunscreen would be predicted to decrease your vitamin D levels, but that hasn't really been seen in, in clinical studies. Um, and so when we look at people who are using sunscreen, they really don't become vitamin D deficient. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are a variety of factors that relate to this. People using sunscreen are probably still getting um, a significant sun exposure. Um, and in these studies, it's sort of difficult to control for diet uh, as well. But if you do have a normal diet, um, if you're drinking milk or juices, fish, uh, other dairy products, um, these tend to be fortified with vitamin D um, uh, and you're, you're getting plenty in the diet. If you were not getting any vitamin D in the diet, you would only need a few minutes uh, of sun exposure a day or maybe 30 minutes twice a week um, uh, to provide uh, enough vitamin D that you would need. Um, and so I tell patients, you really don't need to go out in the sun for the purpose of getting vitamin D. You should be getting plenty in your diet and if you feel like you're not getting plenty in, in your diet, then you can just take a daily supplement. I recommend a thousand units per day. Um, uh, that's a little bit more than would be in most multivitamins. Uh, and then you can be assured that you're, you're getting enough vitamin D. Uh, if you're really concerned um, about this, you can have your vitamin D level checked. Um, and as I said, just um, take a thousand units a day. This was a study that was published last year or maybe two years ago and uh, got a lot of um, uh, uh, press. Um, uh, in this study, they, they tried to ask to what extent are chemical-based sunscreens absorbed uh, from your skin into your bloodstream. And so um, they had participants apply sunscreen over most of their body surface four times a day for four days, which obviously is much more than one would normally uh, be doing. Um, and they were able to detect small levels of some of these chemicals. Um, but really the, the conclusion was that um, uh, this really shouldn't discourage people from using uh, chemical sunscreens. But you know, if you do uh, apply excessive amounts that yes, these chemicals uh, can get into your bloodstream. But um, I'm gonna show you, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit further about why I really don't think this is a concern. Uh, really, the ingredients used in sunscreens have been used for decades. Sunscreens that we use now were developed in the 1970s. And not only are they in sunscreens, but they're in a lot of other products as well. Uh, zinc oxide um, uh, is a white pigment that's uh, used in a number of, of products. Um, it's even in, in these protein bars uh, where it's used as a colorant. Um, so it's obviously safe. Um, and as I said, it's really not absorbed through the skin if it's applied topically. Um, and um, years ago, th these were associated with, um, you know, more of sort of a, like a thick white paste, like you see in, on the guy's nose there. But um, uh, in, in modern times, um, 
These are micronized. And so uh, these are basically um, uh, prepared as, as small particles that um, can still uh, reflect the, the UV rays, but um, because they're small particles, they don't have the same uh, deep white color that the old uh, zinc oxide used to have. Um, and um, there was some concern at one point that um, maybe these micronized nanoparticles could react with UV and maybe generate a different type of um, substance called free radical, which could be um, could damage uh, human tissue. But it turns out that um, even if that does occur, uh, these really don't appear to be toxic on human cells. They don't cause mutations in the DNA. And so it's really not a concern. Um, uh, it's not really right. I just want to point out uh, the FDA does regulate um, uh, nanoparticles that are in foods, but not in cosmetics or sunscreens. Um, this was a, a, a not so humorous episode uh, that I, I read about at one point where um, this guy was using a, a, a chemical sunscreen that was a spray on. And um, he was doing this uh, near his barbecue grill uh, and um, actually uh, ignited uh, his skin and, and suffered serious burns. So um, this is because the propellant uh, is flammable uh, in these spray on sunscreens. We generally don't recommend sun, uh, spray on sunscreens because you're really not getting um, enough product on the skin. A lot of it just goes into the air, uh, but there is this hazard also that they are flammable. So that's something to um, keep in mind. Um, finally, I'll just conclude with, um, you know, I've told you why I, I favor the mineral-based sunscreens, but historically these are not rated as highly as many of the chemical-based sunscreens by consumer reports. Um, and so we actually looked into this and, and published uh, uh, this commentary uh, several years ago. And so it turns out that the, there were major flaws in, in how consumer reports was reviewing sunscreens um, and the way that they were um, testing them. Um, and without going into too, too many details, basically their, um, their, their scoring system were based on these different factors, which really were biased against mineral-based uh, products. And so based on their scoring system, a mineral sunscreen is gonna score low. But as I said, there, there are a variety of, um, uh, of reasons that why I think mineral sunscreens are better than the chemical sunscreens. Um, namely being that they're more stable, they don't break down and they can, don't have to be reapplied uh, as often. Um, so I think I'll conclude my presentation there and uh, we'll be glad to take questions. Thank you for your attention. My name is Scott Florell and I am a dermatologist and dermatopathologist here at Huntsman Cancer Institute and the University of Utah. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers of today's event for inviting me to speak about the Melanoma Pathology Report. So over the next 20 or so minutes, um, I'd like to review the purpose of the Pathology Report, uh, discuss the three main components of the Pathology Report, including the gross description, diagnosis, uh, and the microscopic description, and then provide a short primer uh, on how we uh, diagnose melanoma. So the purpose of the melanoma pathology report, uh, like any pathology report, is to first of all provide an accurate diagnosis. And then specifically for melanoma, uh, to provide characteristics of the tumor uh, for appropriate staging and treatment planning. Uh, so this is an example of a typical uh, melanoma pathology report. And so uh, at the top here is the diagnostic line, uh, so malignant melanoma. Uh, and then we also included some important prognostic indicators. Uh, one, that it's ulcerated, uh, and the second part, uh, the depth of invasion. And we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. The next part is what's called the gross description. Uh, and that's uh, essentially what we see uh, in the laboratory. Uh, and it's all the preparation of the tissue before the pathologist examines it uh, under the microscope. And then the last part is the microscopic description along with the uh, table of prognostic attributes. So this is a patient that I saw in my clinic a couple years ago uh, who presented with this uh, lesion on the arm, which is unlike anything else that this particular person had. 
uh, and had been changing, and so the person was uh, quite concerned about melanoma, um, as was I. Uh, and so the lesion was removed entirely in clinic uh, using a technique called a, a shave excision, where we basically uh, shave off the entire lesion. Uh, and then the biopsy, uh, after removal, is immediately placed into a container uh, of formalin uh, for fixation. Uh, and the formalin container is labeled appropriately with the patient's name and some other identifying information uh, and, the, and the location from where the biopsy was taken. We also provide what's called a requisition, um, uh, which is clinical information that we provide uh, to the pathologist uh, about what the lesion looked like, um, that it had been changing, and that we're concerned about the possibility of melanoma. Uh, so first of all is the gross description, and that literally is just a description of the tissue that we receive in the laboratory from the clinic. And so you can see here um, that we compare the bottle with the requisition, so it's labeled appropriately. Uh, the patient name uh, matches uh, what's on the requisition uh, to make sure we have the right uh, case. And then uh, there's a description of the actual specimen. So we look in the bottle, we remove the tissue, uh, and uh, describe it as a shave biopsy. Uh, and then we provide a measurement here, 12 by 9 by 3 millimeters. The next thing that we will do is uh, turn the specimen over and ink the specimen uh, on the cut side uh, with blue ink, and that will help us with margin analysis when we're looking at it with a microscope, and I'll come back to that uh, near the end of the talk, and then some information about uh, what we did to process it. Uh, so in this case, um, we uh, cut the uh, shave biopsy into four pieces, um, so it's quadrisected and then we put it into a cassette for processing. And so this uh, green uh, plastic container, you'll notice has these very small holes or fenestrations so that the uh, fixative and the uh, processing solutions can interact with the tissue. So here's what it looks like after we uh, gross the specimen. Uh, and then we put each of the cassettes on a tissue processor after, of course, closing the lid. Uh, and then uh, this particular tissue processor can hold about 300 of these cassettes. Uh, the specimens then dehydrated in alcohol and finally impregnated in liquid paraffin wax. And so um, we arrange each of the pieces in the paraffin wax and allow it to harden. And so this is the tissue block after we've, uh, after we've arranged the pieces uh, in the block uh, so that they can be uh, cut in the correct plane and then we put uh, the block onto a device called a microtome which takes incredibly thin slices of the paraffin uh, wax with the embedded biopsy. Uh, those ribbons are then floated on a water bath which we can see here in the background and then we uh, take a glass microscopic slide and uh, actually just kind of catch the uh, individual ribbons uh, onto the slide uh, which are then stained with red and blue dyes uh, with our automated stainer and then after cover slipping, um, the slide is then ready for microscopic examination and diagnosis. Uh, so here's what it looks like. Uh, and uh, here's my office. Uh, so here's my microscope, uh, my computer, and then I have a number of cases that are ready to be uh, examined microscopically, uh, and then a pathology report generated. Uh, so just to summarize the gross description, um, that's a description of the tissue we receive in the laboratory. Uh, and then how it's processed for microscopic examination and diagnosis. The next part is the diagnostic line, so ulcerated malignant melanoma uh, with uh, depth measurement uh, and whether or not it's ulcerated, and usually some information about whether it involves margins. And so what I'd like to do is provide a quick uh, primer on skin microscopy. Uh, and the skin, uh, like other uh, organs of the body, is a very complex uh, structure. Uh, so it has three main layers, uh, the epidermis, uh, and then the dermis here, which is thicker, and then there's a layer of subcutaneous uh, fat underneath that. And so I like to kind of think about the epidermis and the dermis as uh, structured like a layer cake, uh, with the epidermis representing, represented by the frosting layer, the same relative thickness, and the cake layer uh, represented by the dermis. Uh, so there, one, there would be an additional layer of the fat underneath, uh, which we don't have here. Uh, but for purposes of what we're talking about today, um, this works just fine. So uh, frosting and cake. So what does that look like under the microscope? Well, here uh, is a section of skin uh, magnified 20 times. And so this uh, line up here, uh, that's called the epidermis. 
and then uh, all this pink material here, um, that's called the dermis, and that's uh, uh, mainly collagen. Uh, here we have a small amount of the subcutaneous adipose tissue or fatty layer underneath. And then this whole thing right here, and that's actually a hair follicle uh, with its associated oil glands. All right, so hair follicle here uh, with the hair shaft. Uh, this is the hair bulb from where the, uh, the hair actually grows, and then the oil glands. All right, so what about melanocytes? That's what, mainly what we're talking about today. And so they reside in the base of the epidermis, so at the base of the frosting. And so if we look at higher magnification of the epidermis, uh, most of the cells here are skin cells called keratinocytes. And then this is the cell of interest though today, and that's the melanocyte. And so these are the cells in the skin uh, that produce pigment. Uh, and they tend to stay just right along the base, uh, between the, the junction between the epidermis and the dermis. You can also think of that as, as the junction between the frosting and the cake. And so they're kind of like a chocolate chip cookie uh, in which all of the chocolate chips have settled on the bottom of the cookie. Um, they are very evenly distributed in the skin, uh, and uh, that's depicted here. Uh, so here's a cartoon diagram that I drew. And so um, the epidermis, it looks fairly flat here, but you can see that we have these kind of finger-like projections. Uh, those are things called reti ridges. And so these melanocytes, which are depicted here in these red dots, uh, are evenly distributed right here along the base uh, of the epidermis, all right? Uh, and so these melanocytes, um, not only do they uh, produce pigment, uh, but they also give rise to benign tumors called melanocytic nevi or moles. Uh, and also the malignant counterpart, malignant melanoma. All right, so the diagnosis of melanoma and moles uh, is based upon looking at the skin we see in the clinic and using the A, B, C, D, and E criteria. Uh, but we also have similar criteria when we look through the microscope. Uh, so very similar, uh, you know, is the, is the lesion under the microscope uh, symmetric or asymmetric? Um, is the border well-defined? And then C would be, um, are the cells atypical or uh, typical? Uh, and then uh, the diameter of the lesion is also very important. So these are all things that we consider uh, as we're looking at a case through the microscope. All right, so what about a benign mole or nevus? Uh, so um, here we have our individual uh, cells, uh, nice and evenly distributed, but in nevi, so here we have a, a nice, uh, uh, just a small uh, mole on the skin. So if that were to be biopsied, we might see something like this. And so melanocytes in moles tend to aggregate in nests. And the nests tend to be positioned uh, here along the uh, base of the frosting or epidermis, uh, as they are depicted here. Uh, sometimes we'll also see uh, uh, nests of melanocytes here uh, in the dermis as well. Okay, so the question that we would ask is, is the lesion symmetric under the microscope? And that means that if we drew a line down the middle, would the left-hand side look like the right-hand side? And in this case, uh, it's quite symmetric. Okay, the next would be, is it well-defined? And so the definition of whether something is well-defined or not is whether or not on each side uh, the, the mole ends in a nest and starts with a nest. So here it starts with a nest, here it ends with a nest. So in this case, it would be very well-defined. And then finally, are the melanocytes confined to the base of the epidermis where they should reside? Uh, and in this case, they are all here uh, along the base uh, of the epidermis. Uh, so yes to that as well. So what does that look like under the microscope? Uh, well, here's a nice example of, uh, of this mole. And so we can see that if we uh, ask the question, is it symmetrical? Um, it would be symmetrical. So the left-hand side uh, looks very similar to the right-hand side, so yes. Um, is it well-defined? And so here we have a nest on this side and we have a nest on that side. Uh, so the, the mole starts here and it ends here. Uh, so it's very well-defined. And then if we look at the cells under higher magnification, uh, they all look alike. And so uh, we would make a diagnosis of a benign mole or nevus in this case. What about melanoma? Well, melanoma is a malignant uh, proliferation of the melanocyte. And so it no longer uh, complies with the rules that are typical for melanocytes. And so uh, we see them above the, the junction between the frosting and the cake. So we see them at all levels of the epidermis where they shouldn't be. Uh, that tend to form these irregular nests, and they can also be seen uh, just singly disposed, just single cells uh, throughout the, the epidermis. 
So is this case uh, is this uh, case symmetric? Uh, so I would say no. The, the left hand side in this case does not look like the right hand side. Um, is it well defined? And again, that we're looking for does it nest on one side and the other? And so on this side we have single cells. And on this side we have single cells and an irregular nest. Uh, so I would say it's not well defined. And then finally. Uh, are the melanocytes confined to the base of the epidermis? And here we have melanocytes at all levels of the epidermis. And so those are all very atypical features. So here's what that looks like under the microscope. Again, unlike our last case, we have melanocytes at all levels and even on the very top of the skin. Um, it's not symmetrical. And the melanocytes themselves um, are not uniform. And so uh, this cell doesn't look like this cell, which doesn't really look like these cells up here. Uh, so in this case, we would make a diagnosis of melanoma. All right, so what's the difference between melanoma in situ and invasive melanoma? And that's a very critical distinction to make. Uh, melanoma in situ uh, uh, means that the melanoma is confined only to the frosting layer or only in the epidermis. All right, so it has no capacity to metastasize uh, because the blood vessels actually reside, uh, the blood vessels and lymphatics actually reside here uh, in the dermis. All right, so the tumor cells are confined just to the epidermis, uh, and here's an example of that. So we have our melanocytes distributed at all levels of the epidermis uh, and uh, is not well defined. Uh, so this looks like melanoma in situ. So by, by definition, invasive melanoma then involves the cake layer. Uh, so the tumor cells involve the dermis. And so here we have uh, that depicted here uh, as uh, uh, irregular nests in the dermis. So under the microscope, um, this uh, epidermis here, the top layer, the frosting layer is thicker, uh, but we have these really large irregular nests, and these are mainly in the epidermis. Uh, so this part of it would be just in the epidermis, but then we can see that we have a few nests down here. And so there are uh, invasive uh, nests of dermal melanoma here. Uh, sometimes making that distinction is very difficult. Uh, so something might look like melanoma in situ, uh, but we, we start to see a few funny looking cells here uh, that we think could be part of the melanoma and in that case would be invasive. And of course that's an important distinction because the treatments would be different. There might be a wider excision uh, that's done and maybe even sampling of a lymph node. All right, so um, sometimes uh, and oftentimes actually uh, we will do a specific stain for melanocytes called melanae. And so that highlights the melanocytes uh, in the epidermis and also here in the dermis. So here's our normal skin over here. Uh, so it's kind of hard to see, but this is the top of the epidermis. This is the bottom of the epidermis, and here's the dermis. And we can see these red splotches are evenly distributed. Uh, those are normally distributed melanocytes. So we can see that that looks quite different uh, than our melanoma in situ, where we have melanocytes just throughout the whole thickness of the frosting, uh, with some here in the dermis, uh, confirming subtle dermal invasion. So the diagnosis here is malignant melanoma, and then we measure uh, the thickness from the top of the epidermis to the deepest melanoma cell, and I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Okay, so here we have on the left, just to recap, uh, benign mole of nevus, which is very organized. Uh, so here's our organization, uh, and uh, clinically, uh, just on the skin, it looks uh, quite bland, uh, looks uh, very benign. And then on this side, we have our uh, disorganized uh, melanoma. Okay, so the diagnosis of melanocytic nevi and melanoma is based on the architecture, how it looks. Is it symmetrical? Is it well-defined? And so forth. And then uh, at higher magnification, um, are the melanocytes themselves, are they bland or are they atypical or unusual in some way? Okay, and so part of that is the microscopic. Uh, so that's really a description of what we see uh, when we look microscopically at the tissue. And so oftentimes we'll just dictate this as we're looking at the case and we'll say that it's a quadrisected shave uh, with a broad asymmetric proliferation of atypical melanocytes in the epidermis and the dermis and so forth. All right, this is the table of prognostic attributes. Uh, and so really it's a summary of the tumor characteristics important in staging, uh, which would be the T category of the TNM staging system. And so I've highlighted the most important of those here in red. Uh, so the tumor thickness, uh, whether or not it's ulcerated, uh, and then here's the pathology staging down here, and I'll show you uh, how we arrive at that. So the most important staging characteristics for primary skin melanoma, that means uh, skin melanoma that occurs just uh, as a new spot, 
Uh, and so this is the uh, TNM uh, categorization. So T refers to the definition of the primary tumor, in this case uh, on the skin. Uh, the N would uh, refer to is there metastatic disease in regional lymph nodes, and M uh, is whether or not there is a distant metastasis in other areas. So we'll be talking about the definition of the primary tumor, the T categorization, and so that's based upon thickness and ulceration status. Uh, and so if we look at the thickness, uh, the T categories are really defined by the thresholds of one millimeter, uh, two millimeters, and four millimeters. All right, so melanoma thickness is how deep the melanoma invades into the dermis. And so um, this was first reported by Dr. Breslow in 1970 as a good tool to predict recurrence or metastasis at five years. It still remains the single most important factor uh, for uh, prognostic factor for clinical behavior that we have. Uh, and so the depth of the deepest melanoma cell is uh, in millimeters is rounded to the nearest tenth and then measured with an ocular micrometer uh, which is part of the microscope eyepiece. So in this case um, this would be the deepest of the melanoma cell and so we would measure that distance from the top of the epidermis uh, to the deepest of the melanoma cells uh, and in this case it would be 0.57 millimeters uh, which would be rounded up to 0.6 millimeters. So what does that look like pathologically? Uh, so here's our case of melanoma. Again, this is the epidermis here. Uh, this is the dermis or the, the, the cake layer, frosting layer, cake layer. So we have lots of melanoma in the epidermis and then we have some aggregates of melanoma in the dermis. So there's our deepest melanoma cell. So um, our measurement then from the top of the epidermis to that deepest melanoma cell is 0.57 millimeters which we round to 0 0.6. Okay, ulceration is the absence of the intact epidermis overlying the, the invasive melanoma. Uh, so that means that the frosting is actually gone uh, over the invasive tumor. This is a major prognostic factor. Um, it's uh, strongly related to tumor thickness. Um, it's associated with disease progression and has been part of the staging system uh, for uh, many years. Okay. So here's our epidermis, and then I've kind of tried to draw in here uh, the area where the epidermis is absent and the tumor is ulcerated. So here's what that looks like uh, in the, uh, under the microscope. Um, so here we have our intact epidermis here, and here's our dermis. And then this whole area is actually melanoma. So invasive melanoma, so it's involving the cake. Uh, and then we have this, uh, this crust here, uh, which is uh, present overlying uh, the area of ulceration. So we look at higher magnification, we can see that the epidermis is still intact, and then here it really thins out, and then right over here it's completely absent. Uh, so by definition, this would be uh, an area of uh, ulceration. Okay, so here we have non-ulcerated melanoma on the left-hand side. Here we have ulcerated melanoma on the right-hand side. Okay, and then margin assessment, and that, that answers the question, does the melanoma involve the inked edges of the tissue. So remember in the gross description, as soon as we get the tissue out of the bottle, uh, we will ink the cut surface uh, with a blue dye. And so we can see that blue dye here. And so if we see that, and we see that the melanoma actually uh, involves the blue dye, that means that we have a positive margin, uh, meaning that there's some remaining in the, uh, in the individual patient. Okay, so if we put this all together, here we have a very atypical, um, asymmetric, um, irregular pigmented lesion. Uh, diameter is more than six millimeters. Um, the color is uh, variable with uh, different shades of brown and black, and then kind of this kind of grayish white here in the middle. And so clinically, this would be very suspicious for malignant melanoma. So the lesion was completely removed, excised. And so here we have a section of that uh, excision an excision means that it's a full thickness all the way through the fat. And so we can see here that this is our melanoma. And then this thin line here, that's the epidermis. This is the dermis and this is the fat layer. Uh, so we can see that the melanoma is basically here. Uh, we don't see it in the margins. Okay, higher magnification. Uh, it's an asymmetric uh, lesion, uh, poorly defined tumor. Uh, the cells are very atypical when we look at them with higher magnification. And so we diagnose this as invasive melanoma. Uh, we do a measurement uh, from the top of the, in this case, the ulcer 
uh, to the bottom of the, uh, the, the deepest melanoma cell, that's 1.9 millimeters. Uh, the epidermis is ulcerated. And so if we go back to our table, our primary tumor, uh, so here we have our T2, which means a tumor that's between one and two millimeters in thickness. Uh, so it would categorize, be categorized as a T2 lesion. And then it's ulcerated. And so that would actually give it a T2B uh, designation. So just to conclude, uh, the Melanoma Pathology Report provides diagnostic information for assessment of prognosis and treatment planning. Uh, so thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for allowing me to speak today at the Melanoma Patient Care Symposium about new surgical management studies in melanoma. I have no relevant disclosures uh, for this talk today. And I want to start off by reminding everybody that melanoma is incredibly common in Utah. We have uh, the highest rate of new diagnoses of melanoma in the United States, uh, mainly attributable to our altitude and uh, northern European background. And we see over 300 patients in the surgical clinic at the Huntsman alone. Most patients, uh, as you may know, with melanoma do not present with advanced metastatic disease. Most patients are treated by dermatologists or surgeons and have localized cancer that has not spread uh, anywhere outside the skin. And if, if it has spread, there's mainly small amounts in the nearby lymph nodes. And surgery alone cures many of these patients. However, we're always looking for new studies that can help us improve the way we do things, whether it's uh, standard surgical resection of primary tumors or uh, more advanced tumors, or even try to better improve our ability to prognosticate outcomes for patients and see how they'll do in the future. Most people, when they present with a primary melanoma, have a lesion that might look like this. They go into their doctor and a biopsy is performed and ultimately a surgery is done. Some of you may have even seen a picture or a drawing of us drawing out margins around the biopsy site uh, in a planned excision and ultimately the patient is left with a linear scar after the excision. And this procedure called a wide local excision is standard therapy. And the concept is that we're removing not only where the melanoma was, but adjacent normal tissue that might harbor uh, intralymphatic metastasis around that site. And when we do that, we get excellent local control and long-term outcomes. The NCCN is a national guidelines uh, uh, committee that uh, helps to guide us with these surgical management questions. And we've used their help to determine certain margins around melanomas based on their thickness alone. And, and, and these margins were not just uh, pulled out of the blue. They were uh, actually determined by uh, several large clinical trials done almost 20, 30 years ago. If you can imagine 100 years ago, they used to take much larger margins than they do today, maybe even up to five centimeters of normal skin around the biopsy site. And it's unclear if the current guidelines based on these trials are relevant today in an era where we have more effective treatments. And here enters uh, the first study that I'll talk about. This is the Melmart II clinical trial. It's an international prospective randomized trial evaluating margins for thicker invasive melanomas. And patients are entered into this study if they're interested and they are randomized to either getting a one centimeter or two centimeter margin around their primary melanoma. Neither the surgeon or the patient chooses that, it's chosen for them. And the primary outcomes that this trial is looking for are impacts on recurrence risk to their melanoma and the quality of life. This is a really important part of this study in that we are not sure at all that the increased size of the removal of skin around the melanoma uh, has any impact on their cancer outcome, but it certainly can have impact on how their scar is reconstructed. Oftentimes skin grafts are used and uh, flaps are made to, to cover large wounds. And so uh, could these margin differences improve upon those types of reconstruction and improve upon uh, other important issues in quality of life, neuropathy, pain, how fast can someone get back to work? So this trial will address all of these things and we're very excited to be able to participate in it. Um, it is a very large study 
and it started and originated in Australia in the United Kingdom. They're planning to accrue almost 3,000 patients, and up, up to date, uh, the numbers include about 800 have been enrolled. We were one of the first sites to open in the United States here at the Huntsman, and we've en enrolled about 25 patients, and we'll continue to do so as part of our, our national cooperative group moving forward. Some of you may also have had a procedure called a sentinel node biopsy that was done as part of the treatment of your primary melanoma. Uh, in this procedure, we're not only removing where the melanoma was biopsied, but also one or two nearby lymph nodes to see if there's been early spread of the cancer. And to date, it's the most important risk factor for recurrence and death for earlier stage melanoma. That is, whether or not you have spread of cancer to your lymph nodes or not is an important uh, risk factor uh, for the tumor coming back someday. There are some limitations to this type of procedure, although it does add some helpful information. Most patients don't have spread of cancer lymph nodes, and that's a good thing. Maybe 60 to 90 plus percent of the time when I do this operation on patients, the pathology comes back as negative, no spread of cancer, and that's great. Uh, great news for the patient and for us, and certainly limits the amount of other treatments they may need. Uh, it's really hard to predict exactly who needs the procedure. Most of those patients probably uh, could avoid it. However, we, there's not really a good way to know who's going to have spread or not. And uh, several have asked if there's other ways that we can identify patients who may be at really, really low risk of having tumor spread uh, to their lymph nodes. And this enters the second study that we are about to start accruing patients to. This is the Merlin trial run by Skyline, a company out of the Netherlands. And uh, one of the questions that was asked is, can we identify things from the primary tumor itself, gene mutations that might uh, predict lower risk patients where sentinel node surgery could be avoided? It's a prospective observational study, so patient treatment will not be changed necessarily by the results of these tests that are done on the patient's primary tumor. However, the outcomes as we follow patients who are enrolled on the study will be critical for knowing how, how important this type of a test might be in, in making decisions about treatment for those early stage melanomas. We, along with nine other US institutions are participating and uh, we, we think that there may be about one in five patients that can avoid this surgery as part of their initial treatment and be assured that their recurrence risk is very low for their melanoma which would be helpful for a lot of people. Lastly, I wanted to talk about some more advanced patient cases, ones that um, are difficult as we approach them. Uh, this patient, as you can see on the left, has a large mass underneath their armpit, and that was found to be melanoma. And they did not have any evidence of other disease outside of that area. And, you know, we approach this slightly different than the wide excision that we saw earlier. It often involves a very large operation removing that mass along with other lymph nodes in the area uh, in order to eradicate uh, any cancer that may be left behind in that region. These are called large lymph node dissections. The sobering fact about these operations is that although it's we can very uh, effectively remove those masses and tumors in most patients, there's a very, very high risk that the cancer will come back elsewhere after the operation, sometime in the first year to two years after the surgery. And when that happens, there's a much higher risk of death. In addition, we worry about lymphedema. That's uh, the long-term swelling of the extremity associated with very large lymph node operations with or without radiation. And we see very high rates of lymphedema, especially in the inguinal region uh, concerning the leg and the thigh, which could be impact patients' quality of life in a negative way. There have been a lot of advances over the last few years. Some of you may have even seen some of these treatments that use uh, immunotherapy or targeted therapy getting your own immune cells to fight off the cancer. And people have asked, could treatment with these effective agents before surgery help? We know that these treatments can reduce the risk of recurrence if given after surgery. And we know that their risk of recurrence with surgery alone is very high. Now, does treating before surgery make the removal of the tumor easier on patients? And does it decrease the risk of recurrence and death even more than surgery alone? 
The last study I will mention today is this uh, SWOG 1801 clinical trial looking at what we call neoadjuvant approach to immune therapy. Patients are in with those large lymph node metastasis are enrolled and then randomized to either standard treatment, which is surgery followed by immunotherapy after surgery, or a few cycles of immunotherapy before surgery and then treatment afterwards um, after we've removed the tumor. The primary outcome is uh, event-free survival. Uh, how many patients will recur or not, and when does that happen after either of these treatment uh, strategies? And whether or not pathology at the time of surgery can help predict long-term outcomes. In other words, how well the patient responds in that treatment may uh, give us a better idea of what their likelihood of recurring is in the future. The studies already include over 300 patients, and we've uh, put 20 or more patients on this trial. We're one of the lead accruers in the United States. To summarize, surgery remains essential for many patients, and the current trials are looking at fine-tuning the technical details of the uh, initial operation, also improving the patient risk assessment, and maybe reducing unnecessary surgery. Lastly, we're trying to integrate the newer immune therapies in an effort to improve outcomes overall. Thank you again uh, to all of you for listening today, and thank you for those that have participated in these trials. We could not make advances without your contributions. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm happy to be here to talk to you today about a blood test that we studied to help determine if a patient's melanoma has recurred. So the question we addressed was, can a blood test accurately detect melanoma recurrence after surgery? This was a collaborative project between Huntsman Cancer Institute and Intermount Healthcare with patients from both sites. So the problem, as the audience knows well, is that melanoma recurrence increases with the higher stages of disease. The thin melanomas that have normal lymph nodes have a less than 10% risk of recurrence. But with thicker melanomas, we see a 20 to 50% risk of recurrence over time. And patients who have abnormal lymph nodes can be over a 50% risk of recurrence over time if they have a lot of disease in their lymph nodes. We also know that melanoma recurrence can happen even years after the initial treatment. The common ways that we detect recurrence now are with frequent skin exams and with imaging. We know that skin exams work in detecting new skin cancers, moles that are changing, and detecting patterns of melanoma recurrence around the scar or in the lymph nodes. Imaging also is helpful in visualizing deeply seated lymph nodes that might be hard to feel on exam, or in looking at the organs for melanoma recurrence. So both of these have a place in detecting recurrence, but there are problems, especially with our imaging. Patients know well that imaging is expensive. There are also some downsides to frequent imaging. The contrast that we use can damage the kidneys and some people are allergic to it. There's also claustrophobia, anxiety, and other issues around getting scans that trouble our patients. And so looking for a more cost-effective and maybe simpler approach to detecting recurrence of melanoma is needed. And this may be found in a blood test. Some melanoma tumors shed their cells and their DNA into the patient's bloodstream. We know this from early studies that have been done. Detecting that circulating tumor then may be a way to detect melanoma's recurrence, melanoma recurrence early. So how does this test work? It starts with a biopsy that's done by the dermatologist or other diagnosing provider who takes off the initial spot that's concerning for melanoma. That little bit of tissue alone uh, may be enough to uh, have a test like this. The more tissue we have, the better, but in this study, we looked at the primary skin melanomas offering that tissue or disease from the lymph nodes if the patient had diseased lymph nodes. Once the tumor is biopsied, that tumor tissue was sent to a industry collaborator who is able to make what we call an assay from that tumor that's personalized for the patient, meaning the mutations in that melanoma that are specific for that patient's melanoma were identified 
And then a test was made that could be used to screen that person's blood to see if their melanoma cells are circulating in their bloodstream. The big effort of this test is into making that first assay from the tumor. Once it's made, it can be stored and used again and again. So blood tests can be drawn before and after surgery or at any time point in the future to see if there is melanoma DNA in the blood. So this graph on the right shows that if we detected blood, say before treatment or before surgery, it may be high um, as the upper blue dot shows, but then after surgery or other treatment, we would expect it should return to normal or non-detectable. But then over time, we could use it along with skin exams and imaging to see if the melanoma has recurred. So next, I'm gonna present the early results from our study. We recruited stage two and stage three melanoma patients. These were all patients who will be going to surgery for their melanoma. And these patients all had sentinel lymph node biopsy unless they had obvious abnormal lymph nodes on their first exam. And in that case, that involved lymph node with the others would be removed. You can see in this pie chart that most of our patients were stage three, which means lymph nodes involved. 17 of the 25 had abnormal lymph nodes. The blue part of the pie chart shows that eight of our patients were stage two, meaning they had thicker melanomas but had normal lymph nodes. We drew their blood before surgery and then within a month after surgery. We sent off their melanoma tumor to have it analyzed for the specific mutations and that specialized test was formed for each patient and then we checked their blood against that test. This pie chart shows that our blood test was able to detect melanoma in almost half of the patients. So the blue side, 12 of the 25 patients had circulating melanoma tumor in their bloodstream. 13 of the patients, we could not detect a signal of any melanoma in their bloodstream. We found that the melanoma blood test was more likely to be positive or abnormal in patients with more disease. And that kind of makes sense. The more tumor that was in the patient, the more likely the tumor was shedding cells into the bloodstream. So this chart shows that in the stage two patients on the left, that blue um, bar shows that just over 20% of the stage two patients had detectable melanoma in their bloodstream, while over 80% of the stage three or lymph node abnormal patients had detection of the melanoma in their bloodstream. Interestingly, in the blood draws that were done postoperatively, we found that all patients who had an abnormal melanoma blood test before surgery had a normal blood test after surgery. So in other words, their body was cleared of that circulating melanoma DNA after the surgical treatment. This shows an actual report from one of those patients where on the left side, the red arrow shows that the patient had detectable levels of melanoma tumor in their blood before surgery. They underwent surgery and then to the right, that green arrow shows that they had no detectable melanoma in their bloodstream after surgery. So it's returned to the baseline and can then be followed in the future to see if it ever goes back up again, which could correlate with recurrence of the melanoma. So in conclusion, we found that we can detect melanoma DNA in the bloodstream with this test. It was a pretty simple study for the patients to do. We just had to use their tumor that was already being used for diagnosis of their melanoma. And the patients just had to undergo a blood test before and after surgery, a simple blood draw. We found that melanoma DNA is more likely to be found if the patient has more melanoma present in their skin or lymph nodes. So the especially the stage three patients who had abnormal lymph nodes, those patients, over 80% of them had detectable melanoma DNA in their bloodstream. But regardless of the stage, all patients who had a detectable melanoma DNA level before surgery had complete clearance of the melanoma DNA postoperatively after surgery. So that shows us that we can then use this test as a possible marker for recurrence because now that we have the test developed for these patients, we can do any number of blood tests we need to in the future. 
And we are currently extending this study for those 25 patients where they're going to have serial blood draws done along with their planned skin exams and scans to see if the future blood tests would correlate well with any risk of recurrence and to see if it correlates with, for example, the imaging. If the imaging shows something abnormal, does the blood test go up? What that would help us do then is perhaps at some point in the future, we'd be able to eliminate some of those scans for patients and just rely on the blood test, which would be cheaper for the patients and simpler. I want to thank the patients who volunteered for the study and our study investigators that are listed here. This is a team effort uh, between dermatology, surgical oncology, medical oncology, and our pathologists who have to carefully analyze the tumor and help get it prepared for the melanoma test to be developed. Uh, so I want to thank um, all of the team for all this team for their work and I look forward to any questions. Good morning. My name is Siwen Hulis Govan. I'm a medical oncologist um, specializing in melanoma at Huntsman Cancer Institute. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today. These are my disclosures. Immunotherapy has transformed cancer treatment. Chemotherapy or other type of anti-cancer treatment can shrink tumors, but eventually most patients with metastatic cancers would die from their disease. Immunotherapy, on the other hand, is associated with durable response that can be translated into long-term patient survival. On the right side of the slide, you can see the survival of patients with metastatic melanoma being treated by immunotherapy. At five years mark, more than 50% of those patients treated by combination immunotherapy are still alive. This is significant improvement from 15% two-year survival just 10 years ago. Checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy is what has made this transformation. On the right side of the figure, you can see in the tumor microenvironment, activated immune cells can kill tumor cells through recognition of tumor antigen. But PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint can stop this um, anti-tumor immune response. Anti-PD-1 antibody bind to PD-1 receptor take away the PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint so that the immune cells can continue to kill. Approved anti-PD-1 in melanoma include pembrolizumab under the chain name of Keytruda or nivolumab under the chain name of Obdivo. On the left side of the figure, you can see in the regional lymph nodes, when naive T cells are being activated by the antigen presenting cells, the CTLA-4 checkpoint can block the immune activation. Anti-CTLA-4 antibody binds to CTLA-4 receptor take away this checkpoint so that the immune cells continue to be activated and go to the tumor to kill. The FDA-approved anti-CTLA-4 is ipilimumab under the chain name of Yerway. This is a list of FDA-approved immunotherapy for stage 4 melanoma. Ipilimumab, which is anti-CTLA-4, was approved in 2011. Pembrolizumab and nivolumab, uh, which are, which are Anti-PD-1 was approved in 2014. Combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab was approved in 2015. Nivolumab plus relatilumab, which is anti-LAG3, was approved in 2022 this year. In addition, anti-PD-L1 atezolizumab in combination with BRAF-MAC inhibitors Bamirafenib and cobimantinib was approved for BRAF mutant melanoma in 2020. TVAC, which is the oncolytic virus um, that uh, injectable into the directly into the tumor, was approved in 2015, and most recently Tibentafisp, which is a T cell engager, bringing T cells to GP100 expressing melanoma cells was approved um, this year for HLA A2.1 positive uveal melanoma patients. These are uh, important clinical trial results um, that led to the approval of anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, and TVAC. 
Notice most of these uh, recruited patients were treated previously by chemotherapy or cytokines, uh, which are standard of care at the time. This table shows data in the frontline setting in patients who have never been treated before. Therefore, it's easier to understand the efficacy of the treatments. Checkmate 067 in the green box is a trial that recruited a lot of patients with long follow-up and provided useful data to guide clinical practice. In this trial, untreated advanced melanoma patients are randomized to get either epilumumab, nivolumab, or the combination of the two. Nivolumab is associated with 45% of response rate, and five-year survival is 44%. Combination is associated with 58% of response rate and 52% of five-year survival. However, the combination is much more toxic than the single agent nivolumab with 59% versus 23% of severe adverse events rate. And there is data showing efficacy of the epinevo combination in patients who have already progressed on anti-PD-1. Therefore, for majority of frontline patients, we would start with anti-PD-1 and es escalate to combination if needed. We are still trying to figure out which patients uh, should get nivolumab and relatinib combination, as the follow-up is still short with incomplete data, and the toxicity is now trivial. Its for, uh, severe adverse events rate is 40%. There are several situations where we would start with ipilimumab and nivolumab combination. One of the situations is when patients have brain metastasis. Several studies indicate that if patients are asymptomatic from the brain metastasis, the possibility of responding to epinevo combination in the brain is the same as outside of the brain, both 60% of response rate. This is not the case with single-agent anti-PD-1. Um, in the brain, it's only 20% of response rate versus 40% um, for systemic lesions. And if patient develops symptoms from the brain lesions and needs steroids to treat the symptoms, then the response rate goes down dramatically. Therefore, there's a window of opportunity for durable response for asymptomatic patients with brain metastasis and we usually treat them with the combination as soon as possible. Another situation we would treat patients with upfront combination is for mucosal melanoma. This is a rare subtype of melanoma that do not share the same risk factors as skin melanoma, and it's harder to treat. The response rate to immunotherapy of mucosal melanoma is usually half of the response rate in cutaneous melanoma with worse prognosis. Therefore, we usually start with combination immunotherapy to improve outcome of these patients. And of course, if the patient have a large disease burden and we're not, we're not sure whether um, there is enough time for them to go through the sequential uh, treatment, then we will start with a combination immunotherapy to improve outcome. About 50% of cutaneous melanoma have a BRAF mutation, which is the driver mutation for tumor growth and the survival. There are three FDA-approved BRAF and MAC inhibitor targeted therapy for these patients. Retrospective data showed for BRAF mutant melanoma patients the sequence of target therapy and immunotherapy matter, and those started with immunotherapy seem to have better outcome. And this is confirmed by a recently completed phase three randomized trial called DreamSeq. In this trial, untreated uh, stage four melanoma patients with BRAF mutation are randomized to receive target therapy first and switch to epinevo immunotherapy if disease progressed, or combination immunotherapy first and switch to target therapy if progression of disease. There's an overall survival benefit for those patients treated with immunotherapy first, even though all patients can get exposure to both treatments if, if needed. Therefore, we use immunotherapy as first line for all patients 
regardless of BRAM mutation status. Unless the patients have contraindication or develop severe adverse events from immunotherapy. Then what about combining target therapy and immunotherapy and give both as frontline therapy? There are a lot of evidence to show this is synergistic because BRAF MAC inhibitors can improve immune trafficking and infiltration of the immune cells to the tumors and improve the anti tumor immune response. Indeed, the triple combination of anti PDL1, atezolizumab, and the BRAF MAC inhibitors, vamirafenib and cobimetinib, is approved for frontline therapy of BRAF mutant melanoma because of improved progression-free survival when compared to target therapy alone. However, the combination is associated with a high rate of severe toxicity and it may not be appropriate for frontline. Remember, 40 to 50% of patients can respond to anti-PD-1 alone and do not need to be exposed to the toxicity of triple combination. Does anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1 combination immunotherapy work after anti-PD-1 progression? The answer is yes. It is associated with around 30% of response rate, with around 30% of severe toxicity rate, much less toxic than in a frontline setting. It is interesting that nivolumab is important even after anti-PD-1 progression, because response rate to ipilimumab is only 13% in this setting. Taken these data together, it suggests for most patients, starting with anti-PD-1 and salvage with epinevo might be just as effective and less toxic than epinevo upfront. It can spare the toxicity for those patients who would respond to single agent anti-PD-1. But for those special group uh, patients mentioned above, um, including uh, patients who have brain metastasis mucosal melanoma and the high baseline disease burden up from combination is better. There are many promising combination immunotherapy strategies that are being developed uh, in the clinical trial setting, targeting different phase of immune cell activation. The goal is to bring durable immune response to all melanoma and other cancer patients. In conclusion, Checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy transformed the care of melanoma, and a combination immunotherapy can lead to more durable response and a better patient survival. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Hi, everyone. I'm grateful to be recording this session for you all today. I'm here to speak with you about integrative support for people with melanoma. My name is Benjamin Smith. I'm a licensed massage therapist and one of the Wellness Education Research and Training Coordinators at the Linda B. and Robert B. Wiggins Wellness and Integrative Health Center at Huntsman Cancer Institute. So I mentioned I'm here to speak about integrative support for people with melanoma. Integrative health is not simply putting complementary and conventional medicine together. It is an emergent field of study that aims at transforming healthcare through a balance of analysis and synthesis, a focus on health, and an understanding of the fundamental interconnectedness of human life with its environment, both the social determinants of health as well as the physical environment. This is a quote from Dr. Helene Langevin, the director of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health at the NIH. At the Wellness and Integrative Health Center at HCI, our mission is to provide individualized care for people affected by cancer. We offer compassionate support, diverse treatments, and wellness guidance to enhance quality of life through evidence-informed practices. Our vision is to expand services to reach individuals through our diverse communities by offering exceptional care at the forefront of integrative health. I've included this image because it's a beautiful representation of how integrative healthcare leverages connection as a resource for expressing health and how synthesis and critical analysis play key roles in bringing complementary and alternative medicine into patient-centered care. I wanna pause here and invite you to consider what happens to pain when it is shared and supported. Think about what health means to you. What does it look like? 
Imagine what role movement, connection, touch, music, and art might play in reducing suffering and expressing health and vitality. What does this look like? It looks like offering dozens of programs and offerings that have been driven by patient requests and supported by evidence and clinical research. It looks like hiring compassionate and highly skilled individuals who are knowledgeable about cancer and its effects on the individual to provide services such as exercise and group fitness, nutrition counseling, acupuncture, massage, music therapy, writing workshops, and art making. Here you can see listed examples of integrative health modalities, most of which are offered at Huntsman. The only services here we do not provide are herbal medicines and dietary supplements. Now, how does this relate to melanoma? These services are effective support for the most common melanoma-related symptoms that people suffer from, especially pain, fatigue, anxiety, depression, and lymphedema. As we go through this presentation, I'll speak to you about how exercise, acupuncture, massage, and music therapy, yoga, tai chi, and expressive therapies all have evidence supporting their use as safe and effective resources for managing pain, lymphedema, anxiety, depression, and fatigue. They're also available to patients through their entire cancer journey and can almost always be provided in a safe and comfortable way. We've seen these services uh, provide benefit for patients before surgery, during post-surgical recovery through systemic treatments such as chemotherapy or advanced treatments such as immunotherapy. And these services provide meaningful and effective support for every part of someone's cancer journey. There are many frameworks and theories for why exercise and integrative therapies are effective. One of these frameworks is called the biopsychosocial model of pain. This model proposes that, that pain is experienced and mediated by our social and psychological contexts, that our, our social connection, our abilities to stay connected to meaning and purpose and understand what is happening in our bodies has the power to change how we experience pain and suffering. More biomedically oriented frameworks explain how exercise and integrative therapies mediate or reduce inflammation in the body and stress in the nervous system, both of which are established drivers of chronic disease and get in the way of optimal immune function. What does all this mean? It means that human health and disease cannot be entirely broken down into parts and pieces. And that integrative healthcare seeks to treat the whole person. The exercise specialists understanding how important a good conversation is, our massage therapists understanding how important silence can be, our nutritionists understanding how important holiday celebrations are, and acupuncturists understanding how to work with someone who's scared of needles. When patients come in for our services, they often comment on the warm and healing atmosphere, how friendly staff are, now they wish they knew about it earlier. Often people are exploring their new normal or coming and seeking strategies to improve or maintain their quality of life. Many body-centered th therapies make a profound impact on pain by affecting all of these areas simultaneously. Osteopathic manipulation, acupuncture, and massage use touch, engage the nervous system, find leverage in therapeutic relationship, and address tissue level sources of pain, providing an opportunity to fine tune attitudes and perceptions around pain that may make recovery more difficult. Our exercise specialists uh, provide expert level coaching and modification based on strong understanding of the effects of cancer and cancer treatment as they serve as a valuable resource for motivation and engagement, helping people experience progress safely and giving people an opportunity to build on self-efficacy and self-esteem while moving towards their goals. The physiologic impacts of exercise are compelling, and there's hardly a system in the body that does not benefit from regular exercise. Acupuncture has a variety of effects on pain, neuropathy, immune function, stress management, and mood as well. Our services have risen out of patient requests to HCI for services connected to cancer care and survivorship. Many people have questions at this point about accessibility, cost, and reimbursement of these services. Physician visits are covered, but most of our services are not reimbursed by insurance yet. Acupuncture is currently undergoing a trial of insurance billing for Medicare for low back pain that has experienced limited success. And our new you weight management program is covered by most health insurances. One of the biggest barriers to integrative health and wellness is typically thought to be cost. And while that is true in many places, at HCI we have structured our offerings to be as affordable as possible and close to the cost of the average copay or lower. Our exercise therapy program is one of our most popular programs. I've, I've spoken about it a little bit already. We call it the POWER program, Personal Optimism with Exercise Recovery. Many studies show regular exercise can reduce one's chance of recurrence and prevent disease. Dr. Hansen uh, is a physiatrist who provides a full physical assessment and works with our fitness staff to provide personalized exercise plans that meet the needs of each individual. We also offer community programs like power outdoors uh, or fitness classes at the Red Butte Gardens, uh, which are available for free. 
Our power program is a wonderful resource for people who may be dealing with cancer-related fatigue, who may be dealing with functional limitations after surgeries. It's particularly helpful uh, for people who have lymphedema um, to stay active, but to do so in a way that is matching um, the integrity of their tissues. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be gained from guided and safely progressed exercise. And as I said before, it's, it's highly accessible. It's quite inexpensive. Very cool program. Some of the research uh, some of the most compelling research um, on the effects of exercise includes um, a study on cancer-related fatigue where exercise is significantly better than the available pharmaceutical options <laughs> for reducing cancer-related fatigue. There also is a, a mounting uh, pile of evidence suggesting that regular exercise during cancer recovery is significant to supporting immune function. Um, and ends up uh, demonstrating changes, positive changes in neutrophils, monocytes, natural killer cells, T cells, and a number of different cytokines. In addition to the one-on-one -on -one exercise program, we also have group fitness classes. We offer, I think this is, this is even an up-to-date schedule right here. So we offer about uh, 30 classes a week uh, they're offered virtually and we hope to be resuming in person soon. And what's great about these is they're delivered by people who who understand how to grade group exercises to all levels. Someone who is six weeks out of treatment may have a different level that they need to be exercising at than someone who's two years out of treatment. And of course, many other factors come into play there. But all of the, our exercise, uh, our group fitness instructors offer options uh, to make sure that there's something for everyone in these classes. And they're not just about strength and mobility. Um, some of these classes have mindful components, uh, the Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, that provide additional layers of, of stress management and support for symptoms such as anxiety and depression that are connected to melanoma. We also have the Cancer Rehabilitation or RISE program where Dr. Oza has championed the management of uh, cancer rehabilitation from PM&R physicians, uh, bringing together resources from uh, rehabilitation therapists such as PTs, OTs, SLPs with uh, exercise specialists um, to provide a really comprehensive uh, rehabilitation plan and support for people with all levels of ability. We also offer OMM, uh, Dr. Zing, a physical medicine rehabilitation physician who supports the power program, also offers these amazing hands-on interventions uh, that are particularly helpful for, for pain and surgical recovery and changes to the body uh, from cancer treatment. You can see a list of some of the things that it helps with. She's really good at working with nerve pain and tissue restrictions that affect the flow of, of fluids any kind of uh, need for bony manipulation. It's probably better to have her do this than perhaps a chiropractor out in the community that may not be aware of how, uh, how to grade interventions like that to someone's bone density and things like that. So all the acupuncturists uh, here are trained at a master's or doctoral level. They have a tremendous amount of education on the subject and are additionally uh, experts in uh, cancer and cancer physiology and, and how treatment affects the body. So they are very well suited to support people uh, going through treatment or after treatment and really know how to modify, you know, based on how, how much acupuncture someone's had. If it's their first visit, they are really great at explaining it and making it, it comfortable and relaxing. Uh, it can be effective for treating a number of different symptoms uh, and side effects related to cancer and cancer treatment, especially pain, nausea and vomiting, fatigue, insomnia, hot flashes and night sweats, digestive issues, peripheral neuropathy. Sometimes they can get results in one session. Sometimes it takes, you know, four to six sessions, but they understand what is happening in the bodies of people who are going through cancer treatment or recovering from cancer treatment. And so they're an amazing resource. There's also a growing body of evidence to support acupuncture for the management of stress, anxiety, depression, 
cognitive and mental symptoms, headaches and migraines, um, hormonal issues, and you know, again, pain, orthopedic issues. Uh, nerve pain. And there's, and in, in the growing body of evidence, that a meta-analysis of almost 18,000 patients from randomized controlled trials show that it is, it is helpful for chronic pain. So much so that the, the VA has released statements on uh, the support for complementary alternative medicine, specifically mentioning acupuncture. And there's a growing movement towards reimbursement for acupuncture services uh, nationwide uh, because it is so effective and non-invasive compared to drugs and surgery. Evidence supporting the use of acupuncture for managing anxiety, for digestive issues, for headaches and migraine, almost 5,000 participants, you know, collected between 22 trials for that, the Cochrane review there, and suggest that, that acupuncture may be at least similarly effective as treatment with prophylactic drugs. Um, that's a big deal. For the management of stress, for the management of insomnia, um, acupuncture has a huge amount of evidence supporting it. Um, and that's something that oftentimes is, is, is lost in a, in a medical context because you know, we hear Chinese medicine, we think that it's uh, an old practice, but it's been highly researched. Massage therapy. I'm obviously biased here. I'm a massage therapist. I work in the in the wellness center um, with patients. Our team is expertly trained to know how to safely adapt massage for all stages of treatment, diagnosis, and and survivorship. We recently had everyone receive training in manual lymphatic drainage. We continue to offer continuing education and services to, to advance our skills and have something for everyone. There's a growing body of research supporting massage for pain relief, for stress management, for post-surgical recovery, muscle soreness, swelling, and lymphedema. At the end of the day, cancer treatment is stressful, and it is worthwhile and appropriate to come in for stress reduction. Um, there's a piece of massage that is thought to be at least in part connective that our world is is you know rapidly losing connected touch and um, this provides provides that which is something that our physiology needs in order to thrive some really compelling research has come out recently specifically for oncology massage uh, looking at massage for pain relief for uh, cancer related fatigue for nausea anxiety and depression and both the nccih the, uh, the nih group for complementary and integrative health as well as uh, the va um, are expanding support for massage therapy being involved in healthcare for when folks have uh, lymphatic involvement as part of their their cancer journey there may be lymph node removal, there may be a little bit of lymph, lymphedema. Our massage therapists are trained to help support someone with that. We certainly encourage people to see a physical therapist or occupational therapist who's trained to manage it from a higher level and provide education and self-care. But once that's done, if someone needs additional support, uh, they're able to come into our wellness center and, and receive. It's a very gentle, uh, supportive modality that promotes the drainage and recirculation of, of lymphatic fluid, which is, is really helpful, um, can help reduce pain and side effects of lymphedema. Nutrition counseling, I spoke a little bit earlier about that. Um, our registered dietitians are, um, they're not just there to tell you what to eat. They're there to help provide coaching and practical um, advice for moving towards a healthy lifestyle. They are great resources for figuring out how to plan lifestyle changes, how to, how to implement them, um, and how to make meaningful and lasting changes in your relationship with food. Um, there's so much more than just telling you what to eat. So I really recommend utilizing them as a resource, especially because your first visit with them is free. And then after that, I, I don't know exactly how much it costs, but I know it's quite affordable. Music therapy is another service that, that we offer primarily inpatient, but uh, also sometimes around the hospital, and we plan to, to grow that into more outpatient offerings and um, group and community offerings. Um, there's a tremendous amount of research uh, that shows that music therapy is supportive for a variety of different concerns, uh, depression, anxiety, pain, uh, blood pressure, heart rate issues, uh, sleeplessness, um, and it's a really, uh, it's just a wonderful service to help get people get out of their heads and uh, connect, uh, which is a huge part of how we view things. Um, we also have an artist in residence who uh, creates art projects for people to do on a weekly basis, uh, both 
virtually online. You can do in your house with materials that you'd have regularly in your house. So you don't have to go buy anything. And then sometimes uh, offering art kits where you can pick them up at the, at the front desk um, at the wellness center and do them in the waiting area and things like that. So uh, another great example of, of an opportunity to express and create and um, get out of some of the um, some of the symptoms. Last but not least is our writer in residence program. Dr. Susan Sample uh, creates writing workshops and creative writing experiences and will sometimes work one-on-one -on -one with, with patients. Uh, and it's a really powerful experience because it gives people a chance to, to curate their own narrative around their cancer journey, uh, which can have a profound impact on, on how people feel and uh, reducing the suffering that someone might experience. Um, it's also really powerful for people who have metastatic disease to be able to do these legacy writing workshops um, uh, as a way to connect with family and friends um, uh, in later stages. Uh, it's really beautiful, the, the work that she's doing, and I recommend checking that out. Well, thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Hi, Melanoma team. I'm Neely Ulrich. I'm the executive director of the Cancer Center here. I'm very excited about the symposium today and pleased to say the concluding words and it's been really terrific to see everything in the space of melanoma, the research that is moving forward from bend to bedside and prevention. Also the question that everybody faces now, what to do about sunscreen. So I thank you all for coming together today to think collectively with the best brains on what we can do about melanoma here in the Mountain West. As you know, it's a huge challenge in Utah but that extends beyond. And we are really pleased to see that we can now harness the power of immunotherapy and also do a much better job in preventing. So thank you all. And we wish you, I wish you all a wonderful weekend. And hopefully the symposium has given you many new ideas and thoughts on what to move forward next. Onward. 